Um, this seminar is is not really presenting any results from research that we've done yet within the Pathfinder pro, um, uh, project, but it does, I think, give hopefully a little bit of background thinking, which has been coming out of a lot of other work that um, we've done in in my group and and other groups that are including those involved in in the same work package in Pathfinder, like with um, Jochen Markat and so on. Which, which hopefully can explain a little bit of the, the sort of framework for how we think about the policy problems that we're now looking at with the Pathfinder project, which are specific to, um, to flexibility and sector coupling. So, and, and the name of this, this presentation, Carbon, and Ta Carbon Taxis and Other Zombies, and in fact, the idea to, to give a presentation on this came because, um, Leah asked me if I could give a presentation, and she asked me right after I had been involved in a, a sort of political event in Bern that that drove me absolutely crazy. <laughs> and so it was born out of a little bit of um, frustration that I, I picked this pretty outlandish title. Anyway, a zombie is something that is alive and kicking and that according to the normal laws of nature ought to be dead and threatens us all. And that's what this zombie on the previous screen was. And, and so in the next 25 minutes, what I want to do is show or describe how carbon taxes fit that archetype, um, try to understand what is keeping them alive and speculate a little bit about whether these forces are at work elsewhere in the ways that we think about how we how we solve climate change. And, and as I said before, this is, is sort of meant as a, as a window into how a lot of us working in Work Package 7 think about these issues um, and why if at the end of the day we don't, we don't come out with the conclusion that we need stronger carbon taxes, um, people will say, ah, okay, that's, um, that's not particularly surprising. So, um, I want to go through these the definite. So the the first part is show how carbon taxes fit the archetype, and and so I want to talk about how they're alive and kicking, and according to the and the, these three criteria for what a zombie is. Um, and let's start with alive and kicking, and 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 I guess this was highlighted to me um, in that event that I participated in just before Leah asked me to do this lunchtime presentation. It was this event. It was um, it was an event sponsored by Swiss Clean Tech. Um, at the end of October, I think it was actually on on Halloween Day, uh, October 31st, and there were three people speaking there: myself, Patrick Dunner from Avenir Swiss, and Christian Sire from um, Swiss Clean Tech, and um, and and this 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 event first of all was was something that showed me, oh my goodness, yeah, the carbon taxes really are alive and kicking because even. Christian Sire, whose business is is promoting um, the the economic viability of of new technologies, was was in my eyes buying into a lot of the 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 flawed arguments about them, which I'm going to get to. Anyway, other evidence for the fact that um, carbon taxes are alive and kicking are uncountable manuscripts for peer review that that I get, where some PhD students write something like. There is growing interest among policymakers for carbon taxes and other market-based instruments to address climate change. So I think that it, they are alive and kicking. A lot of people, in particular academics, um, make the case for they are the, the go-to solution for climate change. And in fact, in, in the presentation that, that Patrick Dummler gave at, at this event, which I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail, he, he pulled up the same sort of um, uh, uh, neoclassical economic theory, which is is valid theory to make some of his arguments on the left side of the screen. I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's a, a, a typical um, microeconomic graph that kind of provides the basis for the theoretical basis for why you'd want a, a carbon tax. The one on the right is a similar graph that that my colleague Johan Lewistam and I have, have, have drawn and, and put as understanding the logic, uh, put in an article where we tried to help people understand the logic of, of carbon taxes and ultimately why they, um, they may not actually be working because the underlying logic doesn't fit the situation. But I'm gonna get into that in the next bit. 
According to normal laws of nature, carbon taxes ought to be dead. And of course, one, one law of nature, set of laws of nature, are the political laws of nature. We, this is a picture from the, the Yellow Vest movement in, in France when um, the situation was the government put in place a carbon tax on transportation fuels, similar to the one that uh, the, the CO2 law, similar in magnitude to what the CO2 law in Switzerland might have done a, a couple of years ago. That one was, I think, 12, up to 12 rapen increase per liter in the price of transportation fuels. Anyway, the French government proposed something similar, and the people took to the streets with the argument that, that a broad swath of uh, working class and lower middle class French people had no option but to drive their cars long distances to get to work. And... Um, and now that was going to be more expensive, and there was no way they could avoid paying the tax, and, and it was they who were going to be, bear the most burden. Anyway, the, the, the protests were so so strong that, that ultimately the politicians took the, the tax proposal back. Similar things have happened around the world, including in Switzerland, where the arguments about the, uh, the unjustness of, of a carbon tax on, on motor vehicle fuels was probably the factor that led the Swiss voters in last summer to reject the CO2 law and, and set Swiss climate policy back by a few years. Um, they also ought to be dead by the evidentiary laws of nature. And uh, this graph here is, is uh, pulls together two sets of data. The one on the left is, is data which has been collected by OECD, World Bank, and, and, and others on the numbers of jurisdictions with different kinds of political measures. I think these are focusing on the power sector, uh, where you see the by, by far the most common measure are technology support policies, followed by carbon taxes. And, and by these CO2 prices, I mean both carbon taxes and cap and trade markets, uh, like the um, European emissions trading system, and then, and by regulations. So the regulations, there were 70 jurisdictions counted with regulations, and these would be things like CO2 emission standards for cars, and then 60 jurisdictions with CO2 prices. So part, perhaps because of the political laws of nature, we see te technology support being far more common because for all sorts of reasons, they are, they are, they create clear winners and don't create clear losers. So they're politically they have a political advantage over CO2 prices. But then you might say, well, so that's unfortunate. We should be using doing more CO2 prices if they actually accomplish more. And what we see from the graph on the right, which is the best attempt made so far, we did it in the IPCC report to aggregate the assessed impacts of the different kinds of policies. What we actually see is that CO2 prices vastly underperform the other kinds of policies, either technology support or regulations in terms of the, the avoided emissions that can be attributed to them. Now, one valid critique of this analysis is that we're looking at CO2 prices which are not particularly high. And, and if the CO2 prices are not high enough, they're not going to do very much. And, and it could be for the political reasons that the CO2 prices never get to be particularly high. But um, nevertheless, what, what we do see is that, that at least at the level that policymakers have been able to implement them, CO2 prices have, have really underperformed um, the other instruments in terms of leading to emissions reductions. In a, a paper we published, uh, my colleagues, my main colleague on this subject, Johan Lewistam, and a, a PhD student of his, German Besali, and I published um, two years ago, we did the, the best um, uh, systematic review to date of all of the empirical studies of, of carbon pricing um, around the world. We were looking at the effects of carbon pricing, and importantly, we, we looked at the ways in which uh, carbon pricing led to emissions reductions. And one way was through operational shifts, namely changing how assets are being used. So if, for example, a company has a gas fire power plant and a coal fire power plant, they, um, they, with a carbon price, they would use the coal fire power plant less and the gas power, fire power plant more to reduce their emissions. And in fact, the studies find inconclusive evidence of this. Some studies find 
strong effects of carbon pricing on operational shifts. Others found weak effects and, and several studies found no effects. But basically that seems to be the way that uh, most studies have found some relationship between carbon prices and emissions reduction. As my previous slide had shown, carbon prices do lead to a, a reduction in emission, but they seem to happen through operational shifts. And where they don't seem to happen is through technological change, which is this lower thing. And, and we divided the technological change side into three dependent variables. And we, we looked at how all of the studies, what they found about these three, um, these three uh, uh, dependent variables. So low carbon investment. So for example, investment in a gas fire power plant, a new one, rather than a coal fire power plant. And here the studies, some of them found a weak effect and others found no effect. Um, then zero carbon investment. So the investment, for example, in renewable energy rather than either coal or gas. And here the studies, all of the studies that examined this found no effect. Um, so that's not just that they didn't find an effect, they actively found that there was no effect to be seen between the carbon pricing and this investment. And then what about innovation? And this would be things like patent counts. And here the papers um, are a little bit, again, they, they, they not all of them agree with each other. Some find a weak effect and some find no effect. Uh, we kind of argued in our paper that it's this zero carbon investment where no effect can be found, which is actually right now probably the critical thing that we need to affect with policy other than R&D policy, which, which has a result on, on innovation. But this promoting zero carbon investment is the critical thing right now that we need if we're going to get to, to net zero or zero in the energy sector um, over the next two and a half decades. And it's precisely here that we don't see an effect from carbon pricing. And I'm gonna say in a few slides why, give a reason why we think that's probably the case. Um, and then there's the theoretical, uh, side of things, the theoretical laws of nature. And the simple fact is that there is a framework now for how we think about the process of decarbonization down to the point of net zero emissions or with energy zero emissions, which offers a really useful framework. And that is the, the, the theory about socio-technical transitions and how they actually work. And the leading scholar of this is the first author on this paper in, in science, Frank Kales. Um, and, and his research goes back about 15 years with the, the, the seminal papers on this showing that, that um, socio-technical transitions, namely the transition from using one particular set of technologies like fossil energy technologies to using a different set of technologies like renewable energy technologies to satisfy a basic societal need and how this and, and that these transitions happen in roughly uh, consistent ways, that they, they follow typical patterns. Um, together with, with Frank, he and I essentially put together um, a, a piece of work for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which, which has found its way into the most recent assessment report where we talk about the, um, the, the dynamics of these transitions. And um, I'm not gonna show the picture we, we ultimately draw, drew for the IPCC, but this basically characterizes what we, what we describe in the text and, and, and show in a picture where uh, we say, and this comes str most strongly out of Frank Gales's work, but, um, that, that you can talk about these transitions as taking place in, in a sequence of four steps. So where these are the emergence of the new technologies around which a system can be built, such as an electric car around which an electric mobility system, road mobility system can be built, understanding that that needs other stuff there as well, like charging infrastructure and so on. The second phase is early adoption of that technology, often at a time when it's pretty clunky and doesn't doesn't work particularly well um, and is very expensive. The third stage being diffusion where this um, technology and the system around the technology go from being really niche products with very little use to, to being widespread. 
and, and to following an S-shaped diffusion curve in the this, this steep part of the curve where, where we see rapid adoption by a, a large share of the market. And then the final stage being stabilization, where essentially we, the, the market stabilizes around purely that new technology and, um, and, and the old technology more or less vanishes. You know? and, and an example that could come to mind for all of us is, is uh, the, the smartphone, which probably all of us right now have in our pocket. You know, this emerged in, um, in shortly after the year 2000. Its early adoption started in 2007 when Apple introduced the iPhone. And at first, adoption was kind of slow. And some of the mainstream companies like Nokia that were making not smartphones uh, fought back with better models. But, but then within a few years, it went into this diffusion stage where its market share rose really fast, let's say between about 2010 and, and, and 2018. And now we're really in the stabilization phase where where essentially the government is doing stuff that, that is built around the assumption that everybody has these things. So for example, one article I just saw in the newspaper this morning is that SBB, the Swiss train company, is about to get rid of uh, paper tickets and essentially everybody is gonna have to have a ticket on their smartphone. And they're wondering what about the people who don't have smartphones and do we need to worry about them? So it's a little bit of a concern, but basically the assumption is that just about everybody has one. If we look at this framework, we see that there are within each stage different sets of goals that you want to achieve or the government wanting this technology to emerge wants to achieve. And these are different in the different stages and accordingly the policy measures to achieve those goals um, differ according to the stage. So in the emergence stage, really what you're wanting is lots of new ideas coming on the table lots of new patents for new ways of doing things, you know, whether it's new designs for lithium ion batteries or photovoltaic panels or whatever, you want a lot of patents out there, a lot of new ideas that then people can start to work with. And the, the proven policy approach for that is, is research and development funding programs, stuff like what's paying us right now. Although we're not specifically working on the technologies, we're working more on the systems within the technology, within which the technologies work. But it's really the R and D funding is demonstrated to be the, the the critical thing in the emergence phase. In the early adoption phase, what we want is initial investment, which will lead to cost reductions, and we this this happens consistently. And and for reasons I'm going to show on the following slide, it turns out that carbon taxes typically don't work very well from this, even though high costs for the new technology are a big barrier. And what works a lot better are subsidies of various kinds and quota systems. Uh, in the diffusion phase, that's where we start to get a lot of investment taking place and we want a lot of investment to take place. We want market share to really increase. And the things which have proven to work um, are infrastructure. So for example, right now with electric cars, the thing that we need to get electric cars in Switzerland, say, to go from, and this has been demonstrated in several papers, from a niche technology to really mainstream, to go right now, they're at about 20% of the market, to go from 20% of the market to 80% of the market, what we're going to need is a lot of infrastructure, charging infrastructure. And that's exactly what Norway put money into, which is why they are up now at over 90% of the market. We may need continued subsidies and quotas. Um, with quotas that are rising up towards 100%, it's, it's, that's, that's technology specific. It's not completely clear. And we need things like market and tax reform to follow again with the electric car example. We're going to need a, a, a new system for taxing the cars that are driving around. It can't be a fuels-based tax in the future. Uh, we're going to need some other sort of tax system if we're going to pay for our roads. Um, with the stabilization phase, the goal really is if we're talking about zero carbon technologies, is to get down to, to zero emissions within that technology. And the policies that we see working are regulations, prohibitions, um, and support for negatively affected groups. So for example, that was a critical aspect of the negotiation in Germany that led to the phase-out plan for coal-fired power plants. That's how they got political approval for that, political buy-in, was by saying, okay, we're gonna help out the coal workers 
We're even going to help out some of the companies that have been involved in coal, mining coal, and that's just the price we're going to have to pay to get this through the political process. Now, in this whole sequence, the, the place that it comes to mind where carbon taxes would work the best are in this early adoption phase, which is the one phase where cost is really a big barrier. And what we've seen is they don't really work there. So this is kind of a typical situation if we're going into the early adoption phase for a new technology. And, and 20 years ago, this was so solar photovoltaic, let's say. And right now we're talking about synthetic aviation fuels, where the on the left side of this, this, this picture here, the fossil technology dominates the market with close to 100% market share. And you've got a low, the new low carbon alternative, which has a teeny market share, but a very high price. You know, in fact, when in, in 22 years ago, when Germany started supporting photovoltaic, its uh, cost was about 10 times that of conventional um, electricity generation. Right now, the costs for synthetic aviation fuels are somewhere in the range of five to 10 times more expensive than the fossil fuel. So it's a huge co cost barrier to getting any investment to take place. But we need that investment to take place so that we can get to this picture on the right, where we have a little bit higher market share for the, the low carbon alternative. It doesn't have to be a huge market share. That's going to come later during the diffusion stage as the diffusion stage takes place. But to even get into the diffusion stage, we need the cost to come down. And if we think there's an, that enough investment takes place in the low carbon alternative, its cost can be coming down to the point where it's competitive, competitive with the fossil technologies. And this is exactly what we've seen with photovoltaic power, with wind power, um, with electric vehicles. You know, I say with electric vehicles right now, we're at about a 20, 25% market share, and they have achieved cost parity with um, internal combustion engine vehicles. The question, now we're in the diffusion stage, which is going to, where, where the price isn't a barrier, we're going to have to have other things. But to get to the diffusion stage, we have to get this investment to take place, to go from early adoption to the diffusion stage. And the question is, what, what can actually make that happen? And there are really two choices. And, and one option is a carbon price, and the other option is a subsidy or quota. And, and for the carbon price to actually stimulate any investment in the renewables, which is what we need, the carbon price has to be high enough to put the, the renewables on an equal competitive footing with the fossil, which means it has to make the fossil as expensive as the renewables. And in the, the very few cases where this has happened, we, we've seen it be successful. The, the fact is, though, that it almost never happens because, and especially where we have such a big difference in cost between the fossil and the low carbon, like we had with photovoltaic, like we have now with synthetic aviation fuel, that it would essentially have to make the, it would make the fossil fuel almost unaffordable. So imagine we had to, we wanted to use a carbon price to stimulate airlines to, to buy synthetic aviation fuel with a carbon price, we would have to then, the synthetic aviation fuels right now, well, we don't know exactly how much they cost, but, but it looks like within a few years, they're going to be in the range of about three euros a liter. So, and where, where fossil aviation fuel is about, I don't know, 60, 70 cents a liter. So we would need more than a two euro a liter tax on the fossil fuel, which would then raise all the price of all the aviation fuel up to this three euro a liter thing. And that would raise the, the price of flying by, let's say, 40, 50%, um, which, which would, given how, you know, the cost structure of airlines, which is something that politicians would probably be pretty un, unwilling to do. If you compare that with a subsidy or a quota system, it work, looks like this graph on the bottom where um, with a subsidy system, and an example of that would be the feed-in tariff in Germany, which successfully got a lot of photovoltaic built, you put a small surcharge on all electricity that people buy, and that creates a pot of money, and then the pot of money is used to pay for the actual costs of producing the solar photovoltaic power, which still represents a pretty small market share. So, you know, you see here the, the area of that, that horizontal yellow area is 
at least as big as the area of the vertical rectangle. And as long as the, the, the area of the horizontal is at least as big, you get the money you need to support the, the vertical. A quota works sort of the other way around. It says the, the industry has to purchase at least some share of the renewable, and it ends up setting up two parallel markets, one for the fossil energy, one for the renewable energy, with two very different prices, but, but that's okay. That, that second market for the renewables that's very small but has very high prices is legally mandated because of the quota. And then those extra costs are spread among all consumers. And this is what we've seen with, um, for example, the renewable portfolio standards for electricity in, in North America. They mandate, let's say, 10% of the electricity being sold to, to consumers has to come from, from wind or solar. That co originally cost a lot more, and then that led to a very small price increase for everybody. Now, both of these would, in theory, get you to the endpoints. It's simply the fact that one um, gets you there with a really big price increase to consumers, and the other gets you there with an almost imperceptible price increase to consumers. And, and so focusing on the bottom one first, the subsidy quota, it sort of functions like a lever, which leveraging differential market share. You know, a lever converts a small force over a wide distance into a large force over a small distance. And, and that's exactly what, what this subsidy or quota thing is doing. And if anybody's ever had to change a tire on a car, you're essentially using a form of a lever which means you know you crank this thing quite a long time with a little bit of force and you successfully lift the car and you change your tire and, and it's not pretty, but it works. And, and the carbon price is sort of analogous to, if the Incredible Hulk were to, to walk by and say, oh, I'll just pick up your car and you can change the tire. If, you, if superheroes like the Incredible Hulk were really around, that would be great. It would be a lot faster, but, but they don't really exist even even Macron, who I guess thought he was a superhero, couldn't couldn't pull it off. It's just too high a political price to pay to lift consumer prices this much to get a carbon price to actually be effective. Okay, do carbon prices threaten us all? Well, per se, they don't, although this upper carbon price, in a sense, could threaten us all or could make some people feel very threatened if it makes something that they rely on incredibly expensive. So to the, the French um, working class people who went on the streets in yellow vests, they would say, yes, this carbon price threatened us all because, because it made it um, made something that they felt they needed to do because investment in public transportation is, is, is not particularly good, at least not compared to here in Switzerland. So it certainly threatened them. I think a broader question is, does do carbon taxes uh, threaten the efforts to fight climate change? And I think they do if they are perceived, if, if they are an alternative and portrayed as an alternative to the more complicated stuff that focuses on technologies through these different stages. So for example, um, one, one fairly prominent Swiss politician, Gerhard Pfister, uh, introduced an initiative for a neue schlankes und wirksames CO2 Gesetz, a new lean and, 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 and functional CO2 law. And his proposal was basically this, let's get rid of all the complicated stuff which we're doing for the climate, which is a combination of carbon taxes and fees, technology support and regulatory standards, uh, uh, more or less the stuff that the transitions framework says you, you need. He says, this is all really complicated. Let's just get rid of it all and replace it with something simpler and which I think would be more effective, namely a single carbon tax across all sectors supplemented with a border adjustment so that importers of goods would then also have to um, pay, pay if, if something is imported from another country without a carbon tax. So the carbon taxes hold this promise of just absolute simplicity. And if you believe they're effective, then there's a huge temptation. Let's just get rid of all the other stuff and, and replace it with a carbon tax. And that I, I would argue is how they threaten us all if they crowd out the stuff which is actually effective. And this is certainly what we have seen in a lot of places. So you know we, we may see it in Switzerland, we have seen it in Germany. We have seen it um, in the EU with, um, with market-based approaches 
being argued that they should replace and in, in some cases have replaced the more technology specific things. So what is keeping carbon taxes alive, even though they ought to be dead, um, because they don't really work? Um, what's keeping them alive? And I guess I would argue there are three things that are keeping them alive. And the first thing is the perception that climate policies are simply not working, which I think is a, it's, it's a more or less mistaken perception. I'm going to get to that in the next couple of slides. Uh, I think the second thing is the fixation on the easy indicators of emissions levels. And the third is the moral appeal of making polluters pay. So with the first one, I think we do have this perception that climate policies aren't working. And if we could just get carbon prices in place, which we haven't yet done as much as we should, that that would change. So for example, this left-hand uh, graphic is from the Car Climate Action Plan. And just as by disclosure, I, I contributed somewhat to that plan, though I didn't contribute to the writing of this text. The, 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 first, the second sentence of this says, institutional politics failed to show us a way out of the climate crisis. And therefore, we had to tackle this task ourselves. So there, there's a perception that our climate policies are just not working. The, the IMF blog on the right says more countries are pricing climate change, but are pricing carbon, but emissions are still rising. And so emissions are, and that's because emissions are too cheap. So the, there's this cause and effect of we don't have good enough policies and, and they're, so they're not working. So we need to change something and do something we haven't done before, which is carbon pricing at, at a more serious level. What about the, the second thing, a fixation on the easy indicator of emissions levels? So we, we see this all, all, all the time, and, and it's not a wrong thing to fixate on, but it's misleading if it's the only thing we fixate on. So this left-hand one, it's not even looking at, at emissions levels, it's looking at carbon dioxide concentrations um, as measured um, on, a, on an active volcano, which I guess has just shut down this observatory because of the eruption. Anyway, of course, we know that emissions, le uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere will keep rising as long as there are any emissions out there at all. So that's, in a sense, that's sort of, it's misleading to say that levels are continuing to rise because, of course, because we haven't gotten to net zero emissions yet. But we also tend to focus on the fact that at greenhouse gas emissions are, the emissions rates are even rising in this right-hand article, erasing the drop during the pandemic. Um, if you look in more detail at this, you realize that, that the picture is much more nuanced. So this graph here shows the average annual growth in emissions rates over the, the decades of 2000 to 2009 and 2010 to 19. And we see at a global level, this growth has, has fallen, this is from the energy sector, has fallen by about two thirds. Um, and you can decompose that and see why has it been the case? Why has it fallen? And it's been largely because of an improvement in the annual rate of improvement in, in energy intensity and a shifting from net getting worse on carbon intensity to improving on carbon intensity. And, and you basically can see this picture across various regions, including the EU. The US, it hasn't improved, but their emissions are fortunately declining a bit. Um, and they've had a big improvement in the CO2 intensity, which it's another presentation I would argue is, is probably the most important. And then in China, we see similar things there, although one of the big drivers has been a decrease in their economic growth. And then behind this also is the fact that investment changes have really been huge. This graph here shows the rate of um, the, the proportion of investment going into renewables versus non-renewables. That's the jagged line. And back in 2001, um, uh, something like 20% of investment was going into renewables in the power sector and the other 80% into non-renewables, nuclear and fossil. And, and by now we're up at about 80% going into renewables, but it still doesn't have a huge effect. And an analogy would be having to turn this gigantic oil tanker with that rudder. And, um, and then I'm taking too much time, but I'm just gonna tell a story. I've, I've had to do this long ago. I've been a, the, the person steering a boat like this. The, the 
ra racing shells used to have these huge rudders like this yellow one on the lower left. And today they have tiny little rudders, which are about five square centimeters. These boats do just simply don't turn very fast. Why do they have such tiny rudders? They have such tiny rudders because it makes the boats faster because rudders introduce drag. And it's the same thing with turning not the super tanker, but our economy. The fact is, we've gotten better and better at building electricity supply infrastructure such that it now lasts like 50 years, which means the turnover per year is absolutely tiny, which means that our rudder is really tiny. So even if we shift new investment to 100%, it's still going to take a while to shift the overall stock of our electricity generating things. So our policies have actually been working pretty well, and we need to look at indicators like this even though it's going to take time before they have an impact on our emissions levels, because that depends on the turnover stock. And then the final argument is, I think, the attractiveness of making polluters pay. This is from a, a website of the Extinction Rebellion, where they say, our three demands to tackle climate injustice, ban private jets, tax frequent flyers, and make polluters pay. And of course, carbon taxes promise this solution that involves making polluters pay. And um, and so if I think it's easy to confuse the attractiveness of making polluters pay, they may make polluters pay, but they don't achieve very much in terms of getting us towards zero emissions, but at least they've done something. Well, I would uh, personally, I think it's more important that we get to zero emissions um, as quickly as possible. And maybe afterwards, we worry about the justice implications of it. Others may differ. Are there other places where I worry about zombie arguments being made. There are some technologies where I worry. This is a collection of four. A whole lot of new technologies that we think will get us out of the mess we're in. So a solar power station in space. Here's how it would work and help us get to net zero. Or net zero needs fusion. What should investors be asking the front runners? Or small modular reactors. Is micronuclear an option for net zero microgrids, which this article ends up saying it is? or synthetic e-fuels are coming as Porsche invests 75 million in the maker of carbon neutral products for the road mobility sector. And across all of these, which at least the analysis in our group says, there's no way any of these can make a, a meaningful effect in the sector in the time that we have. The common element is the argument that the mainstream ideas, whether solar, wind, or electrification don't work so we need something that does. And that was the end of my presentation.